Like many immigrants, my parents came to the United States in search of the American dream, which is a complicated concept that means different things to different people, but I'm gonna distill it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, which are the odds that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution reaches the top fifth of the income distribution. So think of the classic Horatio Alger version of the American dream. So how common is that in the United States versus other developed countries around the world. In the US, 7.5% of children who are born to parents in the bottom fifth make the leap all the way to the top fifth. That compares with 9% in the United Kingdom, 11.7% in Denmark, and 13.5% in Canada. Now, initially, when people look at these statistics, they sometimes react by saying, oh, even in Canada, it looks like your odds of success aren't all that high, right? Only 13.5% of kids make it to the top, starting from the bottom. But you have to remember, of course, that no matter what you do, you can't have more than 20% of people in the top 20%, right? And so the maximum value that the statistic can take is plausibly 20%. If you had a society where your parents played no role at all in determining your outcomes, you'd expect one-fifth of kids to rise from the bottom 20% to the top 20%. So relative to that benchmark max of a 20% um, rate, these are actually quite large differences in rates of upward mobility across countries. One way I think about it is that your chances of achieving the American dream are almost two times higher if you're growing up in Canada than in the United States. Now, these differences across countries have attracted a lot of attention and have been the focus of much policy discussion, a lot of worry that the US is no longer a land of opportunity contrary to its traditional billing. But what I'm gonna focus on in this talk today is that upward mobility actually varies even more within the United States, and I think we can learn a lot from that. In recent work with my colleagues, we calculate upward mobility for every metro and rural area in the US, and we do that using anonymous earnings records drawn from tax and social security databases on 10 million children born between 1980 and 1982. So basically, all kids born in America between 1980 and 1982. And the analysis that I'm gonna show you is an example of a very important broader trend in economics and social science, which is the use of big data to solve important social problems. So much as you all hear about big data being used in the private sector and companies like Google and Amazon to provide better products, likewise, our vision is that we can use these data to solve some of the most important social challenges of our time. So using this data from, drawn from tax records, we construct this map here, which shows you the geography of upward mobility within the United States. What we do is divide the US into 740 different metro and rural areas, and in each of those areas, we take the set of kids who grow up in that area and look at the same statistic that I started out with, what fraction of the children who start out in a low-income family in the bottom 20% of the income distribution make the leap to the top 20% of the income distribution. The map is colored so that lighter colored areas represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, greater rates of achieving the American dream. You can see when you look at this map that there's an incredible spectrum in rates of upward mobility within America. In the center of the country, in places like Iowa, for example, rates of upward mobility exceed 16%, higher than the numbers we saw for Denmark and for Canada. At the other end of the spectrum, if you look at places like Atlanta or Charlotte, you see numbers below 4.5%, lower than any country for which we currently have data. So even within America, there are some places that are truly lands of opportunity, and there are other places that are better described as lands of persistent poverty. Now, in this big map, you naturally, your eyes gravitate towards the broad regional variation. The Midwest looks good, the Southeast looks much worse, et cetera. But if you zoom into narrower geographies, you see that there's quite a bit of variation even across relatively nearby areas. So here we're zooming into the Bay Area and looking at the data across counties within the Bay Area. And you can see that if you're growing up in the 1980s in San Francisco or in San Mateo or Santa Clara in a low-income family, you had really good chances of succeeding. You have something like 18% probability of making it to the top 20%, which relative to that 20% maximum I was talking about is really a remarkable rate of upward mobility. In contrast, if you go across the Bay Bridge to Oakland, 
you see that the probability of rising up falls by nearly a factor of two. So even within relatively small geographies, there are substantial differences in children's chances of succeeding. So naturally, the question of interest to us as academics and to policymakers is to ask why upward mobility varies so much across areas and what ultimately we might be able to do from a policy perspective to increase rates of upward mobility throughout the US. So the first step in our analysis of that question was to establish that much of this difference in upward mobility across areas is caused by differences in childhood environment. We demonstrate that by studying five million families that move between areas in the United States. So rather than going to the details of the analysis, let me give you a simple example to show you how this works. So let's take a set of families that start out in Oakland and to pick a number, suppose if you're growing up in a low income family in Oakland, when you're 30 years old, you have an average earnings of $30,000 if you grow up in Oakland from birth. Now let's consider a set of families that move from Oakland to San Francisco, where as we saw, kids in low-income families appear to have better outcomes. So again, to pick a round number, suppose if you grow up from birth in San Francisco, you earn $40,000 on average when uh, you're 30 years old. So now consider a family that moves from Oakland to San Francisco with a child depending upon the age of their child. So let's start with families who move when their child is exactly nine years old which happens to be the earliest age we can look at in currently available data. So if you move at age nine, what we're gonna do is then track that child forward 21 years in the data that we have to look at how much that child is earning at age 30. And what we see is that this child, on average, ends up about halfway between the kids who grew up in Oakland from birth and the kids who grew up in San Francisco from birth. That is, that child is earning about $35,000 on average when we look at their incomes at age 30. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who moved when they were 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from Oakland to San Francisco, the less of the gain your child gets. If you move once you're in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all. And if you move after that point, there's no impact whatsoever. So what you see in this chart is that where you grow up really matters, place matters. If you take a given child and move that child from San Francisco to Oakland, you see really meaningful changes in that child's long-term outcomes. And second, you see that it's really childhood environment that appears to be critical, right? Moving when you're an adult doesn't do a whole lot for you. It's moving when you're a kid and particularly moving at younger ages that has a lot of impact. Now, naturally, the next question is to ask, Okay, so we think childhood environment really matters in, in determining kids' long-term success. So what is it about places like San Francisco or the Bay Area in general that generate really good outcomes relative to places like Atlanta where we see much lower levels of upward mobility? We've looked at a variety of factors that correlate with these differences in rates of upward mobility across areas that I've been showing you. And I'm gonna show here in the interest of time the five strongest correlations that we've identified. The first is segregation. We find that places that are more residentially segregated by race or by income tend to have much lower levels of upward mobility. Now, this pattern is so clear that you can just see it visually, so let me give you a couple of examples. So this map here depicts racial segregation in Atlanta. The way it's constructed is that each person in Atlanta is represented by a dot, and the dots are colored such that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. You can see immediately that Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city. The blue dots are in a completely different part of the city relative to the green dots. The blacks and whites live in totally different parts of the city. Now, cities that look like Atlanta in terms of racial or income segregation tend to have the lowest levels of upward mobility in our data. Compare that with Sacramento, which has the same minority share as Atlanta, the same fraction of blacks and Hispanics as Atlanta. You can see immediately that Sacramento is a much more integrated city. The colors, these dots, are much more interspersed, right? And corresponding to that, Sacramento and cities that look like it have much higher rates of upward mobility. So that's the first robust pattern we find. Residential segregation, perhaps because of a lack of exposure to role models or friends or people who are gonna help you get better jobs, 
being in a more segregated area, whatever the mechanism, is strongly negatively associated with upward mobility. We look at a number of other factors, and I'll just summarize these more quickly. We find that places with more income inequality, a smaller middle class, tend to have lower levels of upward mobility. We find that places with more stable family structures, that is, more two-parent families, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. And related to that, places with more social capital. So this is the idea of whether someone else will help you out even if you're not doing well. Places with more religious participation, more civic engagement, those sorts of places tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. And then finally, as you might expect intuitively, places with better public schools tend to have much higher levels of upward mobility as well. So this gives you a sense of what we think is driving some of these sharp differences in rates of achieving the American dream across areas. What I want to do in, in the final couple of minutes is present a different perspective on these issues of upward mobility. So the traditional argument for greater social mobility, I think the reason that a lot of people are interested in these issues at the moment in, in the United States, is based on principles of justice. The idea that everyone should have a shot at the American dream, no matter their family background. But what I want to show you here is that improving opportunities for upward mobility, even if you're not concerned about justice and just want to maximize economic growth and GDP, it might still be of interest to think about how to increase opportunities for upward mobility. To illustrate that, I'm going to focus on one specific pathway to upward mobility, which is innovation, a pathway that's particularly relevant, I think, here in Silicon Valley. In this study that I'm going to describe, we link data on the universe of patent holders in the United States to the tax records that I was describing earlier so that we can study the lives of inventors, so we can ask where inventors in America come from and how ultimately we might be able to get more of them. I'm going to start with this chart here, which shows you the probability of becoming an inventor versus parent income. The way this is constructed is uh, on the horizontal x-axis is parent income percentile. There are 100 dots here corresponding to each percentile of the parent income distribution. And on the y-axis is the number of kids who go on to become inventors, that is, have a patent by their mid-30s. You can see that there's an incredibly strong relationship between your parents' income and your probability of going on to become an, an inventor. If you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're 10 times as likely to have a patent as if you happen to be born to parents at the median of the income distribution in the US. So why is that? One possibility is that it's about the factors that I've been discussing here, differences in childhood environment, schools, resources while you're growing up. Maybe high income kids have much greater access to all of those things relative to low income kids, and that's what's driving this innovation gap. A different explanation is that this is about differences in ability. Presumably, the parents who got to the top 1% of the income distribution were quite talented, and maybe that's why their own kids are more likely to become inventors than be successful themselves. To discriminate between those two explanations, we bring in data on test scores of kids early in childhood as a measure of ability relatively early on and construct this chart here, which shows you your uh, uh, the fraction of kids who go on to become inventors versus third grade math test scores. So each dot here represents 5% of the test score distribution. And what you can see is if you're below something like the 85th percentile of your third grade math class, odds are you're probably not going to go on to become an inventor as measured by having a patent. But if you're in the upper tail of your third grade math class, particularly at the very top, your probability of becoming an inventor really shoots up. Now what's interesting, most relevant for the purposes of this talk, is if we now cut this data, looking at kids from low income and high income families separately, so again, look at the fraction of kids who go on to become inventors versus their third grade math test scores, but now look at kids from relatively high income families in the red, uh, above the median, and low income families in the blue, you see a very striking pattern, which is that high ability kids, these kids who are at the top of their third grade math class, are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high income families. If you're from a low income family and you're at the top of your third grade math class, your probability of becoming an inventor doesn't look all that much higher than the rest of the kids in the class. So to put it differently, these data suggest that in America, in order to become an inventor, you need two things. You need to be smart, as measured by your test scores, for instance, early in childhood, and you need to be from a rich family. 
And that, I think, gives you a very different perspective on issues of equality of opportunity. It suggests that if we can bring more of these kids from low-income families who are doing really well early on in school through the innovation pipeline, that would benefit not only them in terms of greater opportunities for upward mobility, but it would also benefit the rest of us by having more people who might discover the next uh, blockbuster drug or develop the next iPhone. In order to give you a sense to link back uh, to the geography issues to, that I started out with, I'm going to close with, with this map here, which shows you the origins of inventors in America. This gives you a sense of what's driving that innovation gap. So this map shows the fraction of kids who go on to become inventors by where uh, they grew up again, these 740 metro and rural areas. And the map is colored so that darker red colors here represent areas that produce more inventors. What you can see is places like the Bay Area or the Northeast or Austin, Texas, if you focus here, tend to be much more likely to produce kids who go on to become inventors than other parts of the country. Uh, and that echoes a broader pattern, which is that exposure to innovation while you're growing up really influences uh, your own likelihood of becoming an inventor. And this turns out to be a pattern that holds in a very specific way. So the type of innovation you end up doing in adulthood is greatly determined by the area in which you grow up. Let me give you an example. So take two kids who are, let's say, are currently in Boston, and say one grew up in Silicon Valley, like many of you, and one grew up in Minneapolis. Silicon Valley has a lot of computer innovation. Minneapolis happens to have a lot of medical device manufacturers. It turns out that if you look at these two kids who are currently in Boston, the kid who grew up in Minneapolis is more likely to have a patent in medical devices, and the kid who grew up in Silicon Valley is more likely to have a patent in computers. So in a very specific way, children seem to be greatly influenced by the exact environment in which they grow up. And I think much of the innovation gap is explained by the fact that kids from lower income backgrounds don't have the internship opportunities, the networks, the connections that lead them to, uh, to become inventors down the road. And so I think that is potentially an empowering message for many of us here in Silicon Valley because it shows that we can ourselves have important effects on in the innovation gap and on equality of opportunity by giving kids from disadvantaged backgrounds better opportunities. And I think we would all benefit greatly from doing that. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much.